So this is lab 12, right? Almost at the end. Um, we say the best for last, right? So you guys are going to do a bacterial transformation today. So you're going to actually add bacteria, add DNA to a bacteria, and transform it into something that it wasn't before. So transformation. So this is one of the lateral gene transfers you learn about if you take the lecture course um, where, where DNA can go from one organism to another. So these, and you could do this at large scale, right? Whole organisms. So these mice, these three blind mice, right? Um, notice two of them are glowing fluorescent green, their tail, their eyes, their ears, their cute little noses there. And this guy isn't. Um, so why, why do you think they're glowing? Why would you want to do that? Other than it kind of looks cool, right? target areas, target genes, right? We're talking about DNA here, cancer. Research, right? Because you can see these proteins, right? Because they fluoresce. So the, this technology has been used a lot um, to help us literally visualize genetic mutation and genetic, genetic changing. And we can cause this to happen even. So this is my favorite video of this. And it's actually fruit fly sperm that you see swimming there. So you can see the green ones really easy, right? But look carefully. Do you see the other ones? Mm -hmm. The other ones are red. And what, um, it's a really short video. <laughs> um, what uh, fr female fruit flies do is they mate with more than one male. Why would they want to do that? To increase their genetic diversity of their offspring. Right? They, in order for them to be more hardy, right, more likely to survive, it's actually better for her to not be monogamous, right, to actually mate with several um, different males. And so they wanted to see, you know, what happened in the reproductive tract for a female, um, and they wanted to be able to see the difference between the different male sperm. So they engineered one of them to have green sperm, one of the males, and the other male to have red sperm. So that they could see by just visualizing the different sperm from the different males in the female reproductive tract. And they found that they actually compete with each other to get to the egg. Right? But then when they did further research, they found that the female actually produces substances that try to stop that competition. Because again, the whole reason why she's mating with one and one male is because she wants her children to be from more than one male. Right? She wants them to be genetically diverse. Right? Um, and no, and not have this inbreeding, right? Which can, which can multiply um, genetic defects, right? So um, you hear about diseases all the time. They're in particular nationalities, especially in the Jewish Orthodox, um, in that community of people. Um, Tay-Sachs is an inherited genetic <laughs> defect. It's very common in that group of people because of inbreeding, right? You keep passing that gene, that genetic defect, that disease. Um, within that population. Uh, sickle cell. What population has a lot of sickle cell? Anyone know? African Americans, right? Because in Africa they have um, malaria. And in that case, actually having one of the sickle cell genes, having some of your hemoglobin D form is actually a benefit because it actually makes you more resistant to malaria, right? That pl plasmodium that we looked at at the beginning of the semester, right? can't infect those um, sickle cells. So if they have some sickle cells but some normal cells, then they still do okay. The problem is, is that genetically they're heterozygous. They have one good gene for hemoglobin and one bad. Well, when two heterozygous individuals mate, you could end up with a homozygous person who got both defective genes for hemoglobin, full-blown sickle cell anemia, right? Uh, where people who don't have any sickle cell genes, right, they could get malaria and die. So the people who are heterozygous, they predominate the population, but then you have the chances of having children with that disease. Right? So um, genetics is a fascinating uh, field, right? How, how all this stuff works. And then, of course, you can have fun, too. That's actually um, all a bunch of different fluorescent genes. Uh, fluorescent genes that make fluorescent proteins that fluoresce under UV light, um, that somebody used different ones and, and drew that with bacteria. It's actually bacteria on a Petri dish uh, that they drew with. 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that with my STEM kids, except I only have the green fluorescent ones you guys are going to make. Um, but I got these big Petri dishes that I got, and I'm going to pour like ones this big for them to get to draw with fluorescent and pull out. <laughs> so it'll be fun. Let's see what they come up with. They're only going to have one color. One color. So this happens all the time in bacteria. Like when a bacteria dies, its DNA becomes part of the environment and other bacteria can pick it up under certain circumstances and they can incorporate it into their chromosome and utilize that information. And if that's different information, then it might be good for them, right? It might be a benefit. So actually transformation was discovered um, by uh, a scientist who was actually trying to develop a vaccine for streptococcus pneumonia. And he saw that there was two different strains of bacteria and he combined them in the, in, in the mouse. And one, he gave them the dead strain that produces a capsule that makes it very virulent. And he gave the live strain that didn't produce the capsule. Well, that live strain picked up the bacteria from the dead strain on how to make a capsule. So then it made a capsule, it grew, it killed, gave the mouse pneumonia, killed the mouse. And when he took the bacteria back out of the mouse, he found it was encapsulated. Well, how did that non-encapsulated bacteria figure out how to make a capsule? Well, it picked up from the encapsulated one's DNA, right? When it was dead, it became part of the environment, right? So transformation is when a cell takes up a portion of DNA from another organism and integrates it into their chromosome. So they're not truly transformed unless they actually take it in and use it. And they don't always take it in and use it. But we are going to get some of them to do that, right? We are going to transform them. So why is it so important? Antibiotic resistance, right? Um, these superbugs that we have out there are picking up genetic information from other bacteria, other pathogenic bacteria. So um, a Swedish man acquired a Klebsiella pneumonia infection while in India that was resistant to, I always say this one wrong, car a venom class of antibiotics. Um, it's, a, it's, a same, it's a similar class to, say, penicillin type drugs, right? So he acquired this infection, right, um, and it was, it was resistant to this class of drugs. So it has the beta-lactam ring just like um, ampicillin and penicillin does, right? So it's a similar um, type uh, molecule. It was found uh, that the strain had a plasmid. This is a circular piece of DNA in it. And on that plasmid was a gene that they've named BLA for beta-lactamase. We're going to use that same gene today, right? Um, so this code of DNA codes for a protein that's actually an enzyme that can break this beta-lactam ring that's found in penicillin-like drugs as well as this other class of drugs. So, and then, of course, the NDM stands for New Delhi um, uh, Meltillo. Uh, where it was discovered, uh, and then beta-lactamase is the enzyme that destroys the beta-lactam ring, and it was the first one, so it gets the number one. All right, so that's the designation for that particular um, gene. So the dream, gene was transferred horizontally to other species of bacteria, right? So this genetic information has now traveled and, and you know, been picked up by other bacteria. Um, when it moves in that way, it's, it's horizontal or, or lateral. When genetic information is passed from the prodigy down, that's vertical transmission. So when there's a mutation, say, in the DNA, and it passes it on to their offspring, that's vertical transmission. Right? And things can move both ways, right? Something can mutate and pass down and then be passed horizontally. So this stuff can move all over the place, which is kind of scary. So as of October 2015, there are higher than expected levels of resistance in the enterobacterase grouping of bacteria, which Klebsiella, E. coli, right, these organisms fall into this classification. By 2010, there are 180 isolates, right, of bacteria that contain this gene, right? So this gene, this DNA has traveled to several different bacteria, right? They've picked up 
this information, this ability to destroy this class of drugs, the beta-galactinases. Um, multiple different classes um, we've seen resistance against, right, different groupings of antibiotics, um, but most are still susceptible uh, to polymyxin uh, antibiotic, uh, colistin, although colistin, remember, we've used this, right? Where was colistin? The Columbia CNA plate, CNA, sterified colistin, and nelidixic acid, those are the antibiotics in that plate, right, which kill gram Negative. negatives, right? So we select for gram positives. But remember I said you wouldn't actually take that internally, right, because it's toxic to humans. But we can use it in the plates. Um, uh, in a similar mechanism, horizontal transfer, uh, we know that mecticillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus and extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis strains have, you know, again, picked up genes from other bacteria that allow them to be resistant to the different antibiotics that we use to treat them. And E. coli 0157, this has to be, I think, one of the coolest ones, um, and the one that I usually talk about in my lecture class. That particular strain of E. coli has what's called the Shiga toxin. This toxin is found in the Shigella bacteria. So they have this toxin, they've had this toxin for eons, right, as long as we know. And then all of a sudden, some strains of E. coli started producing this toxin. Well, how did they learn how to do that? How did they learn how to make that toxin? Yeah, well, maybe transformation, right? There's other ways. There's transduction where a virus carries the information from one bacteria cell to another, or conjugation if they join up. So we don't know exactly how, but we know it moved laterally, right? It went from one group of bacteria, Shigella, to one strain of E. coli. So these, these one group, they picked it up, and they passed it on to all their prodigy, right? It vertically was transmitted. The bad news for us is that toxin is extremely damaging to the intestines, right? It'll give you severe bloody diarrhea. You would not be in this class if you had that strain right now. You'd be in the bathroom or the hospital. Does that make sense to you guys? So that's why we study these types of things, because it's happening in nature, right? And we want to understand it and um, know how to combat it. So there's some interesting articles about the evolution and prevalence of what we refer to as superbugs, multi-drug resistant. Um, and then we have that new bacteria now. I haven't added it in. I uh, haven't had a chance to read up on it either. But um, they found a bacteria that is, re is resistant to all known antibiotics currently. So that's really frightening, right? you got to really rely on your immune system to take care of that one. Let's hope it can do it, right? Or you don't ever encounter it. Encounter it. So in order for them to actually pick up the DNA, they have to be what's referred to as competent. And only about 1% of known bacteria are naturally competent. will actually take in DNA from the environment. It's very complex, this, this mechanism, but it does happen in nature. Um, they believe there's approximately 40 different genes that are required uh, to make Bacillus uh, subtilis um, competent, to actually pick up DNA from the environment. It requires energy, right? So they're going to have to actually spend energy to bring the DNA in from the environment. So, you know, they're going to have to really want it, right? If I walk down the hallway and I see a dollar, I'll expend the energy and pick it up off the floor. Right? It's a dollar. I could go to the vending machine. Maybe get something, right? Uh, so I could use it. So it's of value to me, right? So for the bacteria, if it's of value to them, they might expend the energy to see if it's really worth it. Right? So they, it has evolved as a way to repair their DNA because they're haploid. They usually only have one copy of their genetic information. How many copies do we have? Two, because we have parents, right? A mom and a dad. They just basically have a mom, right? They're a copy of their mom, genetically. So they don't have that combination that happens for us. So when their DNA gets repaired, this is one of the ways they may be able to pick up from the environment, maybe one of their cousins or, or their siblings or something is nearby and they can pick it up and, and, and patch the damage that's happened to their chromosome. Does that make sense to you guys? 
Okay, um, so, you know, it's under harsh conditions and such that they'll do this type of repair. It can uh, be viewed as a prim primitive means of sexual reproduction because what sexual reproduction is is the combining of two genetic uh, profiles, right? And that's, and that's what we do. Um, so in this case, you are combining genetic information, right? So it could be, quote, unquote, referred to as sexual. So artificial competence, right? We can make the cells competent, make them want to take into the, the DNA, into their cells um, by... Uh, electroporation, right, by applying electronic field. We obviously don't do that here at Delgado. We don't do a lot of transformation. Um, and, of course, this requires um, expensive machinery, right, and expensive little um, chambers for the reactions to, to happen in. Um, so, and, and, and you can even do this technique, although we're doing it in prokaryotes and bacteria, it can be done in eukaryotes, right, um, yeast, molds, things like that. Uh, and they could be doing it to even get them to take other things into the cell, like chemicals or drugs, uh, not just DNA. Right? So we can force the cells to take things into them. Uh, what we're going to deal is with is chemically treated cells. So you have a transformation solution that's in each of the vials. It's a calcium chloride solution at a particular molarity um, to help facilitate the movement of the DNA into these cells. And it's also a special strain of E. coli, again, non-pathogenic strain of E. coli, um, that uh, is more apt to become competent under these conditions, these chemical conditions. So it's not straight up plain old E. coli. Um, and so that way, too, the, more of the cells than normal will, will take up the uh, DNA. So it's believed that the calcium component uh, binds to the negatively charged head group of the phosphates, right? So remember, membranes are at the phospholipids, and so this helps shield um, those uh, negative charge with the phosphates, so the, the positive cations attach to it. And so therefore, the negatively charged bacteria can slip through the membrane. Only one strand is allowed to enter, right? So if it's double strand, it'll be degraded into a single strand, and a single strand will enter into the cell. And again, it's going to look for a spot where it can put it. We're actually going to be using a plasmid today, which is a circular piece of double-stranded DNA, and it's going to take in the whole plasmid, um, not, not just a single strand of it. So there are kits that you can buy uh, in laboratories like I worked in when I was in graduate school, um, it comes with the cells, it comes with the media, it comes with uh, specialized plasmids, and they even have levels of efficiency, right, ones that are extremely efficient at making a lot of transformed cells, um, and others aren't as efficient, and it really just depends on what you're trying to achieve. What's your experiment? How many cells do you need? How efficient do you need to be? So when I was um, at Southeastern, one of the things that I did is that I was trying to copy a large piece of DNA, a gene, from frogs. And in order to do that, you can't really do PCR, polymerase chain reaction, in a test tube. The pieces of DNA are too big. So in order to get lots of copies to be able to sequence that DNA, to actually know the code of the DNA, I actually put it into a construct, a specially designed plasmid. Um, I digested and, and added my... Um, copy from that I amplified from the frogs into these constructs, into these plasmids, into the bacteria, and then the bacteria made copies of the plasmids. And then I lysed bacteria, killed the, grew up the bacteria, killed them, lysed them, and purified back out that plasmid. And then I was able to sequence it on the sequencer and find out the code for that particular gene that I was studying. I did that for three different frogs. But this one of these steps Right, was for two minutes with the cells that I was working for, is sticking in the water bath, and I screwed it up once because I walked away. Right, you guys are only going to do 50 seconds, so you really definitely don't need to walk away. Right, um, and, and and it's an important step in the procedure when you put them in the in the water bath. So, what is bacterial transformation? It's the process by which bacteria take up exogenous outside DNA, right, and they take it within the cell. 
they got to be competent to do it. And this just basically means that they have the ability to take up DNA. We're going to be dealing with um, proteins that are bioluminescent, right? So that means it's, it has the production or the emission of light. So in this case, we're going to shine light. It's going to excite electrons and bounce them back, and that's going to produce the light that we see. So as a result of a chemical reaction during which the chemical reaction is converted into light energy. So anyone know where we got the fluorescent proteins that we're working with? Jellyfish. Jellyfish. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of different organisms that are bioluminescent for and, and by different means. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure about the ones at the aquarium. One of my favorite ones, uh, you know? Yeah, I think so. But you'll notice they're in dark um, section and they have special lighting and and that's so that you can see, you you can visualize them, especially if they're bioluminescent. One of my favorite ones has these little cilia that run along it, and they act as little prisms. And so if you actually read the placard next to it, they're not bioluminescing, um, but they're refracting light like prisms do. And so it looks like there's little rainbows running along their little um, cilia-like projections on them. So those are one of my favorite ones there, but they're not bioluminescent. They're very pretty, though. They're fun to watch. Um, so you ever get to go. So they said what's happening here right, is that the, the light energy is exciting electrons and moves them, and then they bounce back to their ground state. Um, the energy level is really high for UV light, um, but as it comes back, it's, it's not as high, um, and we get that green light um, because of the wave like of that particular protein. So we can go into the mathematics and all like that, but again, remember, this is Peter likes to do that. <laughs> the important take-home here is so smaller wavelengths have higher energy. And UV light we can't actually see, right, because it's such a small wavelength, but it's very high energy. So it really excites those electrons, and then when they bounce back, they emit that light that we'll see. And um, so we see it within the visible light spectrum as green. For that particular protein, ultraviolet light, which is what we're going to shine on it, we can't see. So all the conditions have been worked out already for this experiment. It's actually a kit that we buy from BioRed. So um, there's no figuring it out. We know how many cells to use. We know how much DNA to use, right? It's measured out. We know the transformation efficiency that it's supposed to have for this particular kit. So how many transformed cells we should get per milligram of DNA that we're going to add to our test tubes. Uh, we know the volume of the transformation um, mix that we're going to plate. You guys are going to plate 100 microliters onto your plate. So theoretically we come back and count and we should get about 75 transformants per cell, so about 75 colonies on our plates. Um, normally you do serial dilutions if you didn't know this, right? Like we've done in the past and, and count your CFUs, but again you'd have to keep track of how much you used, right? How much did you put on that plate? So the plasma we're using is a design plasma provided to us by this company. It is copyrighted or patented or something like that. So you have to pay to use it. On it, um, so it's called the P-Glow plasmid. And on it, it has um, several segments of genes. So this segment, the BLA, st stands for the beta-lactinase enzyme. And this is an enzyme that can destroy uh, beta-lactinase drugs. The drug we're going to use is ampicillin, right? So it's a derivative of penicillin. It has that beta-lactam ring. So we're going to actually going to give our bacteria the enzyme to break that ring and be able to grow in the presence of ampicillin. Why would you want to do that? Seems kind of crazy, right? Why would we want to give our bacteria antibiotic resistance? No. So that it can grow when? Or when it's exposed to what? So what do you think? We did this before, but we didn't measure them all out. 
Will ampicillin kill E. coli? Normal plain old E. coli? It will. It will. Remember, it's a penicillin derivative. It actually works against E. coli. We did have it on one of our plates. Right? It does kill plain old E. coli. So if they don't transform, if they don't take in this, this plasmid, what would ampicillin do to them? It'll kill them. But if they take in this plasmid, they're going to grow in the presence of ampicillin, right? So we can use the ampicillin to select for transformants, right? We know if they took in the DNA because they'll be able to grow in the presence of ampicillin before even seeing if they can glow. So this is a way to select for, right? Because we really don't want the non-transformants to grow, right? We just want the transformed ones to grow. So we're going to select. We're going to use an antibiotic to select for transformants by making them antibiotic resistant. The other gene we give them is the green fluorescent protein, right? So we're going to give them the ability to make that protein that when we shine UV light on them, they're going to fluoresce green. But... This particular gene we have under a control mechanism. So in order to be under control, we have to give it the one of the control genes, the regulator protein. So right here, ARAC is the regulator protein. So this is going to regulate whether this protein, the green fluorescent protein, is even transcribed and translated into a protein by the cell. So this is referred to, and this is constituently expressed, both this and the beta-lactinase. So they're always making this protein, right? If they have this DNA, they're always making this protein. It takes energy to replicate a plasmid, and many transformants will eventually expel that plasmid. They're like, I'm done with this, right? <laughs> this is taking up way too much energy. But if we have the selective pressure of if you don't keep this, the antibiotics are going to kill you, right? They're more apt to keep that plasmid if we keep them under that selective pressure. Does that make sense? So it's another reason, other than just selecting for them, but to encourage them to keep that DNA. So some terms that go along with this system. So I'm going to read through these, um, and then I'm going to explain them with, with the next diagram hopefully they'll start to make sense. I get kind of bundled up on some of these two myself, right? <laughs> uh, so operons are a sequence of genetic material that functions in a coordinated manner, right? So it works together. It consists of an operator, a promoter, and two or more structural genes, right? So they make something. Structural means the green fluorescent protein is a structural gene. It makes something. Make sense? Where these other parts of the DNA are going to control this whole whether we make the, the protein or not. So the operator is a segment of DNA which the regulator binds. That other protein, right, is going to bind to this section of DNA. Now if, it, if that regulator is an inducer, its binding to the regulator can change the way it interacts with the operator. Either decreasing the effectiveness of and uh, therefore repressors or increasing the effectiveness in that case activators so sometimes binding will turn the system on sometimes binding will turn the system off right in the case of the arabinose operon which is the one we're using the protein derived from ARAC gene is the regulator where arabinose is the inducer so the sugar is actually going to cause us to be able to utilize this genetic information. So in some of those plates, actually one of them, is the sugar arabinose. So that we can induce that cell to make green fluorescent protein. The promoter site. This is the section, the region of the DNA of the operon that acts for the initial binding site for RNA polymerase. So because remember, we go DNA to RNA. So that enzyme, RNA polymerase, actually has to bind to the DNA and copy that information into RNA. This is the site where it attaches. It's very close to the operator, right? This regulation site where it's going to determine on whether they can bind or not. 
So RNA polymerase is the name and says it's an enzyme, right? It makes RNA from DNA. The structural genes actually code for a protein usually, right? So that is going to be turned into messenger RNA, and then the ribosomes are going to read it and make the protein. So GFP is the green fluorescent protein. That's the DNA. The green fluorescent gene is the DNA, the code on how to make that protein. So arabinose is a five-carbon sugar. Uh, found in hemicellulose and the pectin of plants, right? So this is derived from plants. And normally, um, organisms that would be able to digest the sugar would have this operating system where they would have the regulator would bind to the operator. And that will actually stop RNA polymerase from being able to attach and read the structural genes. The structural genes are usually enzymes to digest that sugar. And even proteins that go into the membrane to allow the sugar to come into the cell and be digested. But what we've done instead, instead of having those genes that would digest or bring in that sugar, we swapped that out, or what, what they swapped it out, for green fluorescent protein. But we're still using this control mechanism where unless arabinose sugar binds to the regulator, polymerase can't attach to the promoter and it can't copy the genes. Right? So this is under control. Right? This region is not available to RNA polymerase unless that sugar is binding to that protein, which makes this accessible. So which, which, what do we have to give our bacteria to get them to produce green fluorescent protein? The sugar, right? The arabinose. So that it'll bind to the regulator, allow the promoter to become available so the RNA polymerase can bind and copy that genetic information. So only one of your plates actually contains sugar and will actually glow. So the regulator is the protein, right, that actually binds to the operator set. A small organic molecule binds, in this case it's the arabinams. It makes changes so that the promoter, this section of the DNA, becomes available so that RNA polymerase can bind. It's called a repressor in this, in this case, right? When this is binding, it's stopping transcription. Right? So it's a repressor. Some genes, some proteins, when they bind, they actually activate. Right? But this system, it's actually a, a repressor. And so it's actually the, the effector molecule, the arabinose, that sugar, actually induces this gene. So, as I said, organisms can break down. So, if they brought in arabinose, the first gene is a, an enzyme to digest. The other gene is another enzyme to digest, another enzyme to digest, right, um, that particular uh, sugar. But our bacteria are not going to digest this sugar, right? It's just going to activate them to make green fluorescent protein. We've tricked them. Right, so these are the structural genes that we've replaced with green fluorescent protein. I'm not going to go over that. So before transformation, do our cells have beta-galactinase gene? No. After transformation? Yes. If they are actually truly transformed, we're giving it to them, right? They're going to have that beta-galactinase. They can destroy ampicillin with that gene product. So the first step is already done for you, right? The tubes are labeled plus and minus, indicating DNA plus and DNA minus. Why are we not going to put DNA in one of the tubes? It's our control, right? It's our control. 
So there's 250 microliters of transformation solution that um, calcium chloride solution already in those tubes. The next is you're going to put the ice buckets and you're going to fill them. You're going to take the ice buckets I have in the freezer. You're going to fill them with water right to the bottom of the tray that holds the tubes, right? So we're going to put them in an ice bath. I got rid of the foam rack, so we don't even have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, using a sterile loop, right? And we have plastic loops that we're going to use like we've used before. So we have Lysol beakers in the back that we'll put them in after we transfer a loop full of bacteria from the plate that I'll give you into each one of those tubes. You can, essentially, there's no difference between them at this point. You could actually use the same loop, or you can use a different one. Uh, ideally, if we want to really do it, we could put it all together and then split it, right, in half. If we wanted them to be exactly the same amount. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Uh, I'm going to put the plasmid in. Right, that's the expensive, one of the expensive things in this uh, experiment that we're doing today. Um, I'm going to put it in each one of your guys' plus tubes. Um, and then I'm going to come around and I'm going to shine UV light on the liquid in that tube. So it's DNA suspended in, um, in liquid. Why would I do that? Yeah, but it's DNA. Is it going to fluoresce? Is the DNA going to fluoresce if I shine UV light on it? What fluoresces? The bacteria are going to fluoresce. Why? What are they going to make? The protein, right? The green fluorescent protein. How do they know how to make that protein? How does any cell know how to make protein? The DNA, right? We're giving it DNA. So my tube is DNA, should it glow? No. Your cells are going to, those bacteria cells are going to take it in, and they're going to turn that DNA into messenger RNA and then into the protein, but only if that plate contains the sugar, right? The arabinose sugar, right? So it's not going to fluoresce, right? There's no protein, there's no contamination in my tube. Right? This isn't a David Copperfield or Chris Angel magic act. This is real science. No illusions here. Okay, so I'm going to put 10 microliters, a loop full, into your plus tube. Right? That's our DNA plus. We're going to add DNA to it. So that's 10 microliters. That's a really small amount. I'm not going to add anything to your plus tube, but if we really want to be truly scientific and keep the volumes the same, what could we add to the other tube? Just straight up sterile water, right? We're not going to do that stuff, though. It's a small amount. Okay. So we've already said before transformation, they don't have beta galactinase. We're going to give it to them in transformation. Do they have green fluorescent protein before we transform them? Are they going to have it if they're truly transformed? Yes. So the next step is we're going to leave those tubes on the ice bath once we add the DNA for 10 minutes. So like I said, we've got some incubation times tonight. The next step, the plates have already been labeled for you. In your book, it tells you to label them. But it's easier for me, since you guys will find out in a moment that I have to put ampicillin in some plates and sugar in other plates, it's easier for me to label them ahead of time so they don't get mixed up. <coughs> so you guys don't have to do that. You're going to take your entire ice bath and you're going to walk back to the water bath that you see in the back of the room that's on at 42 degrees. You're going to take your little white floating racks, you're going to take them right out of the ice and plunk them right into the water bath. You're not going to walk away because they're only going to be in there for 50 seconds, right? So you need to time that. And then you're going to take them right out of the water bath and put them right back on your ice. That's why you want to bring your ice over with you. And then bring it back to your lab bench and we're going to let it sit on ice for two minutes. What's the purpose of transferring both the DNA positive and negative tubes from ice to hot water back to ice again? This is called heat shock, right? We're stressing them, right? 
This is equivalent, y'all, to if you've ever gone on vacation, which I can't wait, going from the swimming pool to the hot tub back to the swimming pool, right? It's kind of shocking on the system, right? We're doing that to our bacteria, right? We're going from the swimming pool to the hot tub back to the swimming pool. And this is called heat shock, and the purpose, again, is to stress them so that they'll want to take up the DNA. Well, we didn't put any DNA in the minus tube, did we? Then why are we shocking them, poor things? It's control, right? We're going to do the same stuff to both tubes, right? And it's also to prove that this is not going to kill our bacteria, right? So if, some, if they don't grow, it's, you know, something else went wrong. So remember I said this step is really important. This step really matters the efficiency. For this particular system, the optimum efficiency of transformation happens at 50 seconds. If you go longer than that, your efficiency drops off. If you don't go long enough, you don't have as good efficiency. You don't produce as many transformants. So step 12 is after two minutes, you're going to remove the rack from the ice bath. You're just going to take it out of the ice and leave it on your lab bench at room temperature. Using a sterile plastic pipette, and actually we're not going to use the plastic pipettes, we're going to use a pipette min and the pipette tips, um, and it's already set at 250. So we'll practice this again. Yeah, we practice this in here, right? Okay. We'll practice again, right? And so I'm going to give you a tube that contains 500 microliter or 600, little spillover. Um, and you're going to transfer 250 to each one of your tubes. You're just going to feed your bacteria some food, right? LB is the name of the food. So we're not, as you guys have already experienced, those little plastic pipettes, right? One mil was hell, right? So instead, we're going to use the pipette men. These things, remember those? The little squeezy bulbs in one mil was hell. Can you imagine having to go to right here accurately twice? Yeah. Forget about those. Okay, why were <laughs> the vial? Why are we going to incubate these vials for ten minutes? Why are we going to feed them and then wait ten minutes before we plate them? Do you think they're going to grow in ten minutes? E. coli's fast. You can actually do it in twenty. It's not going to grow. Yeah, it's going to start using that DNA. And which one will it be able to use and make? It's going to make the ARAC, right, that regulator protein that's going to bind to the operator and actually stop it from making green fluorescent protein, right? But what one are they actually going to make? BLA, right? What is that? Beta-lactonase. That's the enzyme that will destroy ampicillin. So when we put them on the plates containing the ampicillin, they're not going to die if they transform, right? If they took in the DNA and used the DNA while they were sitting on the lab bench for 10 minutes, they won't die, right? But only the plate with the arabinose is going to glow. So you're also going to transfer 10 microliters, right? And you have two plus plates and two minus plates. So you can use the same pipette for the two pluses, but you've got to change pipette tips, right, for the two Minuses. You still don't, you could contaminate, right? You want to switch tips. We, we got plenty of tips. Okay. Um, you're going to use these little preset micro pipetters that are preset at 50 microliters. So, how are we going to get 10 on if it's only 50? It's 50 microliters and we need 100 on our plates. Do it twice. There you go. Right? And do it twice. Two squirts under each plate. Okay. Uh, then you're going to do the same thing for the negatives. And it doesn't matter the order. And actually, you guys are going to be working as group tables. So two people can work on the two minus plates, and two people can work on the two um, plus plates. So you have done at the same time. Once you squirt your liquid onto your two plus and two minus plates from your two plus and minus tubes, then you need to spread the bacteria out on the plate. We're just going to use our sterile plastic loops again. But again, remember, don't cross-contaminate loops. The minus loops can be used for the two minus plates. A different loop needs to be used for the both the two positive plates. You're not going to tape your plates together, 
I'm um, just going to stack them up. But what I do ask is that you write your table number on those plates so we can know whose plates were whose. So what information is going to be provided by the LB DNA negative plate? So LB is just the food, right? DNA negative is our control. We don't give them the DNA. So what's going to happen for that plate? It's a control plate, right? It won't fluoresce. Will there be any bacteria on the plate? Why not? Yeah, well, you're not going to look at them until Wednesday. We're going to incubate, yeah. Yeah, we're going to inoculate it. We're going to put bacteria, right, that we didn't add DNA to onto this plate. So it should grow. It's a control that the bacteria, we didn't kill them in the process, right? It should grow. It can grow, and it's going to show us, too, that they can grow when ampicillin isn't present. And then guess what? We're going to have an ampicillin plate that our plain old E. coli that we now add DNA to. So what's going to happen to these guys? They're going to die. They're our control that proves the E. coli we started with, right, is sensitive to ampicillin. So we'll see no growth on that plate, hopefully. So obviously transformation can occur only if the pigoplasmid was introduced into the solution. So which plates are going to exhibit this are positive DNA plates. But we have two of them. We have one that contains the food, ampicillin and arabinose that we're going to put DNA positive to bacteria on. And then we have one that has LB and ampicillin. So why is this one going to fluoresce as opposed to this one? What ingredient? The sugar, right? The ARA stands for the arabinose, right? So only the arabinose is actually going to bind to that regulator, allow the promoter to be available for RNA polymerase, and we're going to actually make that gene product. The other plate will be just transformants, right? Because the ampicillin is going to keep the non-transformants from growing on that plate. So, efficiency is defined as the number of transformants observed per quantity of DNA. This is usually expressed as transformants per milligram of DNA. So, the efficiency is independent of the experiment variables, such as the volume of the transformation reaction, right? Doesn't matter how much we've got. Um, the portion of the reaction mix that's plated or even the amount of DNA used. Instead, right, it reflects the bacterial preparations, how competent it is, right? How likely are those bacteria to actually take in the DNA? And this is why those kits are more efficient or more expensive, because it's much harder to produce these cells that are highly competent, right, that will take up a lot of it. Does that make sense to you guys? So it doesn't, all that other stuff doesn't matter. So suppose you count of an average of 60 um, colonies per plate on two plates with transformants. The two plates contain both the pigloplasmid DNA and ampicillin. BioRed Laboratory supplies the pigoplasmid in a solution uh, that's 0 0.03 micrograms per microliter. Right? And the loop used to add the plasmid is calibrated to deliver 10 microliters right, of solution to your tube. So remember, we plated 100 microliters, and out of uh, 510 microliters, right, all that mix, right, we had 10 microliters of DNA. You started out with 250 of the transformation solution, and you added... 250 of the LB bra. So what's the efficiency of the reaction described on the previous slide? So first we have to calculate the number of transformants, right? So that's 60 divided by the volume transfer, we put this into milliliters, right? Um, so 100 microliters is a tenth of a milliliter. So we get 600 CFUs per milliliter. So the next thing is what's the concentration, right, of DNA. 
So the concentration is 10 microliters times 0 0.03 microliters per milliliter. Microliter, excuse me. So it's 0.3 micrograms. So, and then we have to figure out how much is in that volume, right? So we have to divide it by the volume. So we end up with point, about 0.58 micrograms per microliter of our solution. Right, that's how much DNA is in there. So if we have 600 CFUs per milliliter, we would multiply by the micrograms. And you'll see the milliliters cancel out, right? And so we're left with CFUs per micrograms. And so we end up with 1,020, right? And so written out scientific notation, 1.02 times 10 to the third. BioRed Laboratory claims the efficiency of their kit should be 80, 800 to 700, I mean, 800 to 7,000 CFUs per microliter. So were they within the expected range? 800 to 7,000? We got 1,000. Yeah. So we're within the expected range in this, this one. Uh, if the approximate transformation efficiencies were were not known ahead of time, then we do serial dilutions, right? To try and uh, figure out how much we should plate. So these are your four plates, right? So you, the, again, they're already labeled A, B, C, D. You have the LB, plain, just media. We're going to do DNA negative, our control on there. You have ampicillin in LB. So this is our DNA negative. We're going to kill the bacteria, right? To prove they can be killed by ampicillin before we started this experiment. Then you have your ampicillin plate, and actually I have my little things, there we go. So these are going to be transform cells, and again, are all of them going to transform? No, so we're going to end up with little colonies on this plate, right, that we could count. And the other ones that didn't transform will be killed by the ampicillin. But will this plate glow? So it has ampicillin and LB. No, because it doesn't have the sugar. This plate, plate D, right, contains the arabinose, it should glow. Right, so we should have a nice pretty glowing plate on Wednesday. And Thursday's class did it, theirs are in the incubator there, they got glowing cells, so, or most of them did. So will your plates look like these demos? We'll see if you can follow instructions, right? Alright, so